Welcome and thanks for joining me virtually for this presentation, a comparison of advanced passive and active cooling solutions on the basis of size, weight, and power. I am Adam Say from Advanced Cooling Technologies, or ACT, located here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I wish I could be there in person to present to you today, but I do have my ACT Israel sales team there with you in the audience. I believe Ron, Nir, and Nurit are all working their ACT logo shirts, and I know that they'd be happy to speak with you after my presentation. My contact details are also available here, and I believe you'll have access to download my slides as well. To provide a little background, I'll first let you know about my team here at ACT. We provide custom thermal engineering solutions based on our extensive experience in the design and development of two-phase heat transfer technology. So we work with our customers on everything from initial design and concept generation to detailed product design and volume production. When our company was founded in 2003, we focused on thermal management research and development, but since then we've grown significantly. We now have over 220 employees. Although our R&D team is still a vital part of our company, we have commercialized many of our technologies and now provide custom solutions for a diverse set of markets, including military, space, and industrial. We all know that product development engineers are continually challenged to make the next generation design of their devices smaller and lighter while increasing functionality. Next generation sensors, power amplifiers, and FPGAs ensure that power consumption will continue to increase. Actually, we joke about how designers are forced to be masters at packaging 10 pounds into a five pound bag. What's often overlooked is the thermal management required for those upgraded devices, which are now more powerful and typically packaged in a way to limit direct conductive or convective cooling. So for today's agenda, I will conduct a brief overview of passive and active cooling solutions comparing traditional technologies versus upgraded technologies and solutions that offer significant size, weight, and power benefits. Starting off with passive solutions, let's talk about heat spreading and other transfer challenges, a few of the most impacted applications, and the range of technologies and solutions that should be considered, including the benefits of heat pipes and embedding heat pipes into conduction plates. We often hear from design engineers that the high heat density components in their systems continue to grow in power while shrinking in size. This leads to a high heat flux situation with large thermal hotspots and high temperatures within the assemblies, or the thermal resistance from their component to their heat sink leads to a large temperature rise. Because of these challenges, they are no longer able to use traditional heat spreading materials like copper or aluminum, because they fall short of the conductivity required to spread the load effectively. In order to avoid the added complexity and maintenance of fans or pumps, a, a more powerful passive technology is obviously the desired choice. But again, traditional aluminum heat spreaders can only provide maybe 167 watts per meter K. And although copper can provide more at 387, it also brings a significant weight penalty. We see these types of passive cooling thermal bottlenecks in a wide range of applications. To make things even more difficult, it's often that these applications need to withstand rugged and harsh environments, including tolerances for shock and vibe, freeze thaw, or salt fog. Here are a few applications where we see these types of thermal bottlenecks making the most trouble, but the full list is quite extensive. So enter the historic champion of thermal superconductors, the heat pipe. In case you're not familiar, heat pipes are passively pumped two-phase heat transfer devices that operate in a closed system. The heat pipe is comprised of three components, the envelope, wick, and working fluid. Because a heat pipe is in a vacuum system, the envelope is needed to hermetically seal the heat pipe and it also provides some structure. The wick acts as a capillary pump to pump liquid to the hot spots in the heat pipe. And the working fluid is the two-phase fluid that actually transfers the heat from one end to the other. So the heat causes the working fluid to vaporize, then the vapor flows to the cooler end where it condenses, and then the condensed liquid returns to the evaporator by gravity or capillary force. Depending on the heat pipe design, we typically see a very low temperature gradient from one end of the heat pipe to the other, usually between two and five degrees C as the delta T across the length of the heat pipe. One caveat here is that the heat pipe is, the performance is really a function of the, of the heat flux in the heat pipe. 
So if you have a very high powered point source, you will see a higher delta T. However, you'll still see a dramatic improvement compared to conventional conduction heat spreading. Heat pipes are governed by several limits that determine total heat transport capacity. As listed here, there are a number of items that must be considered when integrating heat pipes into an application. But generally speaking, the limits are a function of the heat pipe diameter, length, orientation, and fluid and wick properties. We don't have enough time to review it right now, but our ACT website has a great calculator that you can use for initial modeling, and it's a great first step when considering the technology for your application. The upgrade to a common heat pipe is ACT's high K or high conductivity plates. These are basically aluminum plates with heat pipes integrated or embedded into them. And this increases the conductivity considerably. So if you remember from my prior slide, a traditional aluminum frame can provide 167 watts per meter K, but high K plates can provide between 500 and 1200 watts per meter K, depending on geometry and heat sink considerations. If you're working to model a high K plate into your design, we often suggest that you assign your plate with a thermal conductivity of 600 watts per meter K. And if you're close to your desired results, heat pipes can probably be optimized to meet your goals. High K plates offer similar weight and structure strength as aluminum, and all of the critical design features of your plate can also be maintained. As listed here, there are a number of additional manufacturing capabilities available based on your design requirements. And we also offer a thermally enhanced wedge lock called an ice lock, which creates additional heat transfer paths from your car to your chassis, further reducing your thermal resistance. To summarize our swap considerations, we have already seen a significant opportunity for a performance upgrade by using high K plates to increase your conductivity, up to three to five times compared to aluminum, with essentially no weight penalty and no concessions on structural performance. In many cases, we can use a high K plate to achieve similar performance to a standard heat sink, but with a significantly smaller volume footprint. High K solutions can improve fin efficiency and they can provide even more reliability when syncing to a liquid cooled rail in a chassis system. I'll highlight the graphic at the bottom left of the slide where you can see the comparison of results between a traditional aluminum plate versus a high K plate. Both are built into a, a rack that is edge cooled. And for the aluminum heat spreader, you can see that some of the components are reaching max temperatures of 170 degrees C. But when we embed heat pipes and design a high K plate, the max temperatures drop to a much more manageable 93 degrees C. So overall, a 77 degree reduction in the max temperature of this plate. And finally, let's talk about active solutions and how to optimize performance, improve packaging, and lower energy requirements. Again, we'll touch on a few of the most impacted applications, and then I'll provide detail on pumped two-phase technologies that can be considered when traditional liquid cooling approaches will not work. As we mentioned, passive cooling is always ideal, but active cooling is typically required when the power is too high for air cooling, or if there are long distances required to reach the heat sink. Often the problem is that the design engineer needs to minimize complexity and reduce the size of the components, all while meeting a higher thermal performance objective. Some of the traditional mil-spec cooling systems that you may be familiar with incorporate ethylene glycol or synthetics like PAO. However, the emerging technology that is now being solved for these challenges is pumped two-phase cooling. So here are a few real world examples of where pump two phase cooling is being used. One example is the cooling of parallel electronic boards for pulsed direct energy weapon applications, which have both stringent isothermal requirements and size and weight constraints for better mobility. Another example is high heat flux laser cooling, where the high heat fluxes must be dissipated while maintaining tight temperature limits across the diode surface. There are also a number of power electronic um, market examples where high operational reliability of the electronics is required. In these applications, there's often concern about water leaking. So we'll talk about that a bit more in the next slide. A few other common applications would include radars, weapon systems, and embedded military computing. ACT's pump two-phase cooling products are based on patented technologies. Um, our expertise in this technology is accumulated through many years of R&D 
plus design and manufacturing for diverse applications like defense electronics cooling and industrial laser cooling. Back in 2018, ACT acquired Parker Hannafin's precision cooling business, which also enhanced our experience in pump reliability. Although pump two phase looks similar to traditional liquid loops, the superior performance is achieved by combining a non-corrosive and non-conductive dielectric refrigerant with the science of heat dissipation through vaporization. This allows us to increase power densities for high power electronics by more than two times over traditional water glycol systems. Furthermore, we can eliminate the dangerous consequences of a fluid leak. Using evap evaporation instead of flow velocity is also a real game changer when it comes to packaging requirements. Since pump two phase systems require a much smaller pump size compared to traditional liquid loops. And with pump two phase, we can achieve much tighter temperature control and see isothermality over very large areas because the quality of the fluid adjusts as the heat is absorbed. Although pump two phase has a lot of great benefits, it is more complex of a technology to implement. And there are a number of engineering aspects which must be addressed during the design phase. One example would be flow instabilities. In poorly designed systems, the formation of vapor can cause bubbles to block over the hot evaporator. This block and flow can usually be avoided with higher initial flow rate and flow restrictors ahead of the evaporator plate. And even when these higher flow rates are necessary, they are still much lower than comparable single phase systems. In order to promote fast vapor formation, the working fluid must be very close to its saturation or boiling point as it enters the evaporator. So sometimes we incorporate reservoirs with controls ahead of the evaporator. Another key feature in pump two phase system design is to ensure only liquid is being pumped. Pumping vapor can cause cavitation issues and shorten pump life, but a well-designed pump two phase system can avoid that problem. To give a clearer sense of the flow rate and pumping power differences between pumped liquid and pumped two-phase systems, I provided a, a comparison using an avionics application. In order to dissipate 80 kilowatts of heat, a pumped liquid system using PAO as the working fluid would require a flow rate of 134 liters per minute and approximately 5.3 kilowatts of power. A pumped two-phase system using refrigerant would require only 25 liters per minute and 250 watts of power, which is an 80% reduction in flow rate requirements and a 95% reduction in power requirements compared to a pumped liquid system. So a significant difference for sure. And here's a case study where we designed a pump two phase system that required temperature uniformity and very high powers and heat flux. This was for a temperature sensitive laser diode cooling application. In this case, the 1.8 square foot laser diode array needed to be cooled with a uniformity of plus or minus two degrees Celsius across the array. And as the graph at the bottom shows, our modeling results showed excellent correlation with the test results. As a final note, I wanted to touch on ACT's capability to provide system level cooling, including solutions for extremely rugged and sub-ambient requirements. Earlier this year, we acquired TechGuard, which is very well known in the military segment for its environmental control units, or ECUs, as well as TechGuard liquid to air LTA systems, which eject heat to the ambient air and provide cooling fluid at a maximum specified increase over the ambient temperature. And TechGuard chiller systems are utilized where cooling fluid below ambient temperature is needed. These include a vapor compression cycle to prevent cold coolant even when ambient temperatures reach 60 degrees C. For example, here in our picture, uh, TechGuard's L82 chiller provides the system cooling capacity and capability for the KU band radio frequency system. Uh, that's a radar system that detects incoming threats like artillery rockets or drones. With that, I wanna thank you for your time and attention today. Please reach out to us if you have any questions. Our team of expert thermal engineers is always happy to help and meet you and initiate a new partnership. Be safe, my friends. Thanks so much.